Uh, g'day Pac, in here grinding away on the punt for another day. Um, this podcast came up with Joe Pride, who's one of the survivors of the Sydney training ranks. Super humble guy, really hard worker, gets results at the highest level, so I think you really enjoy his story. Um, this week in the Den, we're going to do a podcast on UFC Perth. We're going to do that as a Wolf Den University style podcast we're doing with a punter called Gugabi, who is well known in UFC betting circles, and he's more than happy to try and help us all improve our UFC betting. And then we can put it in practice on Sunday when Islam fights Volkanovski in what'll be one of the biggest sporting events of the year um, in Australia. Um, other than that, if you haven't downloaded the Wolfden app, you've got to do it. All it can do is improve your punting and entertain you. So if you haven't downloaded the Wolfden app, please do it. Great community building. Other than that, enjoy the episode and we'll see you later in the week. Peace. <laughs> Welcome, mate. Yeah. Um, track work this morning? Yes, always. Never miss. Yeah. How was that? Um, very repetitive track work. Yeah. There's not a lot of change in track work, but that's why I like it. I want my horses to, to be in a routine, and it means ridiculously repetitive training cycles. So, yeah. Yeah, but it's and good. It's just starting to get busy now, isn't it? Like, you, you know, all the good races are starting. You've got yeah. all your, your better horses coming back. And yeah. Well, they've, they're, it's sort of a bit of a rule of thumb. You're getting your, your better horses back in sort of early, early to mid-December. Yeah. Uh, to get them ready for a carnival. So everything that's, um, you know, on track to be part of the autumn carnival is very much in and up and running and either trialled or about to trial. Yeah. And you, you're not, you know, two-year-olds, you're not, you don't have a huge amount of two-year-olds, well, do you? Or? It's, it's, been a, it, it's been a way that I've built the stable up, which has given me an edge in some ways in that um, I've only got 50 horses in work. And it, mm. I think a lot of people think I've got more than that because I'm well rep- represented on the track, but it's because I have, I don't have many two-year-olds in yeah. work, which for want of a better term, chew up, chew up a box, you know. Yeah. They're in there being educated and everything else and they're not really racing. So um, mainly having older horses that are up and running is great for my clients, great for me because, you know, end of the end of the year, that 10% training uh, of, of winnings yeah. uh, is everything. And yeah. if I've got boxes that they're not empty, but if they've got babies in them, uh, they're not really earning much per box. So Richard Friedman said when he was on a podcast, you can't possibly make money from just training fees. You have no. to get, no. and, and he's right with that. Yeah. Yeah. Look, if, if you're doing a... If you're doing a really good job, uh, it means it's a very labour-intensive industry. Wages are extremely expensive. And if, you, if you're going to yeah. do everything right, there's very little margin in training. Yeah. And people would find that hard to believe given how much it is to train a horse. Yeah. But believe me, there is nothing in it. Yeah. So, yeah. And um, how many staff do you have? Um, so I work on about 12 to 15 ground staff yeah. and have eight or nine riders. And they do uh, the riders do sort of seven a morning each. So one every half an hour. Got a small window of, of time to get them worked. And it's, uh, it's pretty busy, you know, from, yeah. from the guys start at four. And until about you know nine nine thirty, we're we're pretty flat out. And what time are you up every morning? Three a.m. Uh, the alarm goes off at uh, it's about ten to three, but I'm it's a, another good half hour before I get out of bed. I can tell you, I sort of hit the snooze a couple of times and roll about, and yeah, it's, it's not as easy to get out of bed as it used to be. But I'm always <laughs> always in there, you know, first thing, and I like to um, um, like to be there at, at four o'clock, and that's when the day starts. And and what time you try to be in bed at night? I mean, uh, I just ask because it's such a foreign world. Yeah, to yeah, sure. Um, it depends depends on what I can find to entertain me. So normally in footy season's a bit later because yeah. I'll start and always watch the football. But um, generally, I, I like to I like to be in bed by sort of nine thirty if I can. If I get much yeah. later than that, it's just it's makes the next day a bit day. hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so the yearling sales, there's a lot of yearling sales going on at the moment. Um, did you go to the Magic Millions? Went to the Magic Millions. Yes. Yep. yep. Um, not a sale I partake in that much though. Um, uh, I do a lot more work at the English sales, but for, for that 50 horses I've got in work, I'm looking at recruiting, um, it's normally between 20 and 30 uh, young horses each year. Yep. Um, any more than that, I'm just going to jam. So 20 or 30 yearlings. yearlings. Yeah, yep. right. Yep. And do you buy them outright or, or do you – a bit of everything, I guess. A bit of everything. Um, yep. got, got a couple of great syndicators behind me, mainly yep. um, Proven Thoroughbreds, which are yep. huge supporters, got some really good horses. And then I just buy a few others because I have people coming to me that don't necessarily want to be in a syndicated horse. And then I've got some really good clients that have backed me for years that get me to buy horses for them every year. So, um, and I get it. You're more sort of you're in that lower to mid range. Is that right? Like cheapies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Look, that's and because of the once going back to the way I've built my stable, I, I, I like horses that that that, um, that don't mature until a little bit later. So they're a little bit cheaper as well. Yeah. Um, and because everyone wants those two year olds, and they they just cost a lot more at the sales. Yeah. So you know, I think it's quite easily forgotten what a horse costs, and you'll see a Canterbury midweek meeting and. You know, they'll be banging on about some horse that's just won and it costs, you know, 600000 just won 20-something thousand. Yeah, know, and they're, and they're talking like it's successful. Yeah, like, yeah, I'd like yeah. a better better return for my owners than that, for, yep. than that if I can get it. 
What's the most you've ever paid for a yearling? You, you, um, like, yeah, I think I paid ha- yeah, um, half a million that was bought privately once. But, um, geez, most of mine, I would say they wouldn't average any more than 100, 150,000, yep. yep. which, you know, in today's yeah. language is pretty Nothing. cheap, but we've yeah. done really well with horses yeah. out of the price range. And it's not like uh, the value of a horse isn't like a, a yearling, that is, isn't like a, uh, isn't like a car or a house. There's um, what you pay for them's can be you know in years to come can can totally not reflect that price yes that price yeah category so yeah and you didn't make it to Caracas to Caracas no no I did a really wise move I felt like I had too much on that weekend and I bailed out early on Friday morning and I was watching the news that night and it had been flooded so it was like yeah good yeah. call yeah good yeah, call. yeah that, was, was, that was good and so your focus now will turn to English Easter with the yearlings yeah English classic first and English then, classic I'm sorry and are you yeah that I, I yep. feel like that would be a better sale if you yep, if you yep. get 100 150 bought range. plenty of good horses out of that sale um, yep. and then we go to Melbourne for yep. the um, for the premier, premier sale yep. and then back for for Easter where again not really active but have got plenty of nice horses out of Easter in the past yep. so out of those three English sales what what kind of how many horses do you think you'd be picking up um, this year it'll be a bit lower but somewhere around if I counted the syndicated horses oh, that, probably only 10 to 15 yeah. So it's good. Yeah, and I don't have plenty. I don't have any trouble yeah, I don't have any trouble selling horses because um uh it's it's quite select, you know. It's not like I'm I'm bombarding people with, you know, t- uh, 30, 40 yearlings to look at. Um I fill up the horses pretty quickly, which is great. People have got good faith, got great backers behind me and um yeah, it's not a not a part of my job that I particularly enjoy the sales part. So yeah. I don't want to overcomplicate it or, or chew up too too much of my time doing that. I don't want to I I became a horse trainer to train horses, not not sell them. So. And why do you not like it? It's just boring having to inspect every horse and. Oh no, no, so I don't mind the actual sales process. In that, when I say sell horses, I mean once you've once you've bought them, you know, I don't want to be you know cold calling people yeah. try and sell them a horse. Yeah. You know, I I always believe I I don't mind selling myself as a trainer, and I yeah. you know I'm uh, I'm really happy to do that because I believe in myself. But when you're talking about a year, yeah. how good do you know? I mean, not, what do you know I'm, about them? I'm not a salesman personally. Like some yep. people are salesmen. Do you consider yourself not, not a salesman? Not at all. Not yeah. even close. And yeah. you need – probably a big part of horse training is being a good salesman, right? Yeah, sure. Well, not to say yeah. you can't succeed if but you're But as I say, I'm, I'm more happy to sell my skills as a trainer. Yeah. Um, and that and that in itself gets horses into your stable. Yeah, and there's plenty of trainers who are real salesmen, aren't there? Of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very good at it, yes. So let's go right back. So it says on your website that you were studying psychology yes. at Sydney University in the late 1990s. <laughs> Um, so when did the punt first come into your life? Or the, or Long game? before that, actually. So when I was at high school, I just had a group of mates and, and uh, we loved we loved having a punt. And uh, we'd even the, – the school was pretty, can we say, slack. And we, was, this we Mount, could, was this Mount Druitt High? Yes, yeah. yeah we, right. could, we could nip down there in the lunch hour and, and have a bet. And what, was, what was the local race course to Mount Druitt? Rose Hill or something? <laughs> so there is no local. It's a long way from a race course. So, yeah, Mount Rose Druitt, Hill would be the closest. Penrith, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, Getting out to yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'd, we'd sort of do that and spend um, spend a lot of our time just, uh, as I say, a group of mates who loved loved to bet and I fell in love with uh, with the game right there and more from a punting angle at that point. Uh, it wasn't yeah. until later that I was introduced to what the animal, the, which... What was the horse in, in that era that, that really... I had a few, but I excited. absolutely loved uh, Viander Cross. Yeah. It was a fantastic horse and I thought his story was amazing. Raymond Shane Dine. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, that was pretty disappointing. Um, but I had a few, yeah, and, and as you do, you just fall in love with with, uh, with different horses and, and it was just a game that I just think it's the ultimate challenge to me uh, from... Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a gambler in that I don't like casinos or I don't like any other forms of gambling, but I think punting on horses is different you know you can you really feel like you can beat the odds and and it's mm. um it's a different challenge you've got an amazing athletic animal um a trainer there training them a, a jockey riding it and um it's just a beautiful sport and that's why yeah. we're, we're in it yeah so let's let's stick with that then i was going to talk about the pun a bit later but so you've always enjoyed punning and have you always approached it from the point of view of like i'm punning to make money or have you been on punning to for enjoyment more fun yeah, yeah. more fun and, and particularly since i've been training because um there's so much it, it's it's um it's it, it's never been there's never been a better time to be a trainer yeah. and you don't really need to punt and I've, I've always found punting a bit of a a bit of a distraction in ways yeah. if I, I think the way i can get the most winners every year is by not thinking too much yeah. when i need to think about where a horse can win mm-hmm. that's important yeah. but um you know if i was trying to set things up it's quite artificial in the way you do it. and i think you're better off or i've always been better off myself um just concentrating on the horse and on the day that they're ready to win, they'll they'll win. Not try to yep. manipulate it too much. But do you still punt occasionally? Yes. Yeah, 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 I, so yeah, you, yeah. You, yeah. I love backing my horses, and yeah. uh, I'm not a big punter, but yeah. uh, um, reasonably su- successful at it. Yeah. And um, 
I like having a quaddy on the weekend. I always have a have a quaddy, but yeah, mainly back my own horses, and I love them at odds because I'm, you know, when they're two and three dollars, I, you know, and I don't monitor my betting as in I don't keep a keep a, a, you know an account of it. So it's just for fun. Someone on Twitter said that they heard you were a very sharp punter back in in the day. Is that? <laughs> It sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll be that sharp punter. Yeah, yeah look, so I've, you, always, you, I've always done a ride at it. So, yeah, great. Um, I, I just enjoy it. I say more than anything, I enjoy it. And I do, do it for the fun, um, but it's not um, it's not something uh, I, it's not something I'd never give up because I enjoy it too much. Yeah, awesome, awesome. All right, so back to the so you started um, getting into horse racing at high school, basically, and then there must have been a, a good seven or eight year gap to when the late nineties when you're doing psychology at Sydney University. Yep. Did you have any involvement in horse racing then in that period? No, no. So, uh, and it's probably been to, to my advantage and, and racing is full of, um, you know, families and, and dynasties yeah. um, and people, you know, uh, basically just working out their way up through their family to do it. And I came into racing without any of that. And I think, as I say, I think it was to my advantage because I, I came in as a, very much as a blank slate mm. and um, I was impressionable and it was just a matter of finding the, the right people. And, um, I started off at, at Rose Hill, which which was great because uh, uh, Barry Lockwood and Bruce Johnson were there, and two um, two uh, well they weren't country trainers or city trainers, but they were from Tamworth, and they were they took me under their wing and really showed me a lot of the, the skills that I w- was going to need to you know to work around horses. So and you were just working their stables, and what, what was yeah. this? Uh, before you were doing the psychology Oh, sorry, degree? no, no. So I didn't even didn't even go through a year at Sydney Uni- University. Yeah, so you just straight away. Like, absolutely no hated way. it. Yeah. Honestly, it just wasn't my scene at all being and, a student. And then you made your way out to Rose Hill? Yes. And started right. working? Yes. Got it, yeah, got yeah. it. Okay, cool. Yeah, it, went, it was in the, uh, the holidays of the first year, at the end of the first year, and I uh, went and got a job, as I say, with, with, with Barry, and I just fell in love with it. So it was, he gave oh, me real. a couple of colts to walk down to the track, and I thought, look at this, I'm being yeah. paid to walk racehorses. And how old were you was, back? When was he? Uh, 20. 20, yeah, hmm. yeah. And um, so we'll move to the John Size time, which um, which was pretty quick. It's yeah. Quick. So I spent four years out at Rose Hill, two years at Billy Mitchell's, and then it was about ninety six, I think, because I'd only been working around horses for um, um, four or five, uh, well, six years, and um, I found John. And so. was it was Dignity Dancer? Did Billy Mitchell have Dignity? He had that Dancer, at the time, that? and General Nadine. Yeah, so right. a couple of really good horses at the time, yeah. And Dignity Dancer, was that a Zabil, one of the first yes. really good Zabils? Yeah, That's yeah. going back a long way. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he was a very good horse. So, and the funny, the last podcast I did was with Mark Reed, and Mark Reed talked a lot about um, the horses that he set up for punts and yes. whatnot. And his trainer, his personal trainer was Henry Davis. Yeah. And what's interesting about Henry Davis is he mentored John oh. Size. John Size then mentored you. Yes. So when I read that the other week, I was like, oh, that's really cool. And it's a good segue. Yeah, that the and last... John worked for Mark as well. Yes. Yeah. John, John Size worked for Mark. Yes. Not right. I didn't realise that. Yeah. 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 So he had a, that really good background of, uh, and brought it into, and he trained previously, but brought that into tra- his training as well. And it's important, you know, we need to understand um, uh, much more than just the animal to be a good horse trainer. We need to understand, you know, how to place a horse and, and punting teaches a lot, a lot of those yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah, when you put your mm. money on it, 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 it makes a big difference, <laughs> doesn't it? Sure does. So, okay, so you, so let's move to when. How did you start working for John Size? Yeah, so I was a l- little bit lost to be honest. I'd sort of uh, um, gone to a couple of different stables, and um, it, it just didn't feel like there was much direction there. And I, I, I wasn't, um, I didn't find anyone um, up until John that really seemed to um, uh, not not understand because plenty of plenty of them were good good people that I worked around, but that had just a, an amazing understanding of, of, of a horse. And when I watched John, when I went there and, and I watched him work with, with the horses, he just made so few mistakes and he was just, it was amazing the results we were getting. We were yeah. getting tried horses off, off people and, um, and winning group races with them and yeah. they hadn't even looked like winning, you know, anywhere yeah. to that point. And it, it was just an eye opener. It was just like, wow, what is, what is John doing here? Yeah. And uh, he wasn't, he, I wouldn't call him a good teacher, um, he uh, he told you very little, yeah. but it was it was observation yeah. and um, and the occasional yeah you, know, you could but ask all the questions you want, but you didn't give much information. Was he trying to mentor? Do you think like could you tell like I, you know he's he's a bit old school and he's a bit you know keeps himself a bit, but was there definitely like a mentorship? Oh, oh and there? still is to this day. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there is. But he, as I say, he's um he, he works very differently from anyone I've ever seen. He's, and he's a quiet, reserved person. Yes. So yes. he's not someone to just you know. You know, embellish or, uh, or at all actually, but yeah. um, tell you everything he's doing. He very much, um, you just watched him and, yeah. and learnt that way. Yeah. And you're still in contact with him now, obviously? Yes. Yeah. 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 So um, I get the occasional horse ready for him, but when I'm, um, sometimes when I'm, you know, things aren't going that well, I just have a few words. I mean, he's always got some, some good advice. Yeah. So he seems to know what's going on in my life, even without. 
being in contact all the time, which is good. That is nice. And so he got offered a role in Hong Kong. Do you remember what year that was? Yeah, so that was about 2000, I'm pretty sure, because yeah. I, I think my first year is either 2000 or 2001. So it's around that mark and it was something that just thrust me into being a trainer because I, I honestly, I didn't think I was, I was ready, but I wasn't prepared to um, knock back that opportunity. You know, he presented me with some, some owners. So he, um, he said, Joe, I've got the job in Hong Kong. Yep. You, I, I'm going to leave you with everything basically well no there was there was a couple of there at the time and and, and uh we were in our own um went our own ways but he he gave me summer so i started off with about from memory it might have been 20 horses yeah um and you know gave me gave me the gear and and, and, fair, and he was right at the top of the premiership wasn't he when he left doing right? really well i think we ran second to i oh, would have been crown lodge yeah. and gay waterhouse in a couple of years that i was there and yeah, he was really just starting to make his mark, and he wasn't in Sydney for that long. Um, but as I, say, I wasn't ready for it. But as I say, it wasn't, wasn't an opportunity I was prepared to. I thought I'll give this a go. Mm. And there were times in that first year I've got to say where I sort of thought, "What have I done? Yep. You know, this is this is this is not good for for me. I'm not." Um, so you got a whole lot of boxes at Randwick. Uh, no, I had to start at Rose Hill. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I couldn't get boxes at Randwick, and uh, started at Rose Hill. Got some boxes at Warwick Farm there eventually, and it was a really rough. And I've conveniently forgotten a lot of it now, but it was a really rough sort of first 12 months because it was a real baptism, baptism of fire. Yeah. And, um, but uh, I think in, in a lot of ways it made, uh, it toughened me up. It, 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 it was character building. What was so tough about it that just you weren't having winners and there was no money coming in and you were Look, worried about going broke? It wasn't long before we started getting winners, which wasn't too bad, but it was more just a going from being a foreman to having to make all the decisions and and um, and just the people around you had to convince them you know you know what you're doing. So you find yourself, and a lot of trainers will, will, will tell you this is what it's like when, when you begin. Find yourself uh, compromising what you want to do to keep someone happy. Yeah. And it's not the way to train a racehorse. Yes, you yeah. really need to be. And and one of my I've got to say one of my strengths, so strength and a weakness, depending on how you look at it, is just being quite um, single minded about things. Yep. And I'm not really open to that much um, compromise on those things. Yep. But it. But so you sort of mostly make the final decisions. One person needs to train a racehorse with plenty of help yep. from the right people, but one person needs to be making decisions. I don't think a committee can do it. It just ends up messy. Yeah. Mm. And someone asked me on Twitter, do you still follow a lot of the methods that John Size taught you and even to the point of the feed that you feed the horses? <laughs> We're having a laugh about it this morning. The cop rice supply is just one small part of the feed that I make is, um, is, is struggling. They've got something wrong with, this, with one of their suppliers. And it will be the first time I've had to make a change to those feeds in 20 years. So yeah, right. I've adopted John's feeding methods, which is feeding once a day, which is unusual in itself. Yeah. And I haven't changed anything. So what, do, what would normally f um, trainers feed their horse? Um, how oh, how would you go eating once a day? Mostly twice. How would you go eating once a day? It's, it's, it sounds a bit cruel, doesn't it? It's not. <laughs> so the horse exercises, uh, has that feed waiting for when, when they get back. And it's, it's whatever a trainer would feed, but all just at once. Yep. So they're not missing out on any feed. Yeah. They've got access to hay the whole time if they're a bit of a guts and they get through the grain quickly. Sure. Um, but, yeah, it's a, bit, it's a bit different. But, yeah, I adopted that and then – And why do you think it's a good strategy? I think it definitely helps with um, gastric ulcers, uh, yeah. which horses suffer from. They've, they've, um, and it's what, I, what I found around feeding time, horses can get quite anxious – and um, if you've got several feeding times, there's times where they're getting a, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've got dogs, but when you go to feed the dogs, they're not that happy with each other and they fight amongst each other. And it's just a, it's a stress-free way for them to be um, looked after. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yep. Cool. Um, and on John Size in Hong Kong, has Hong Kong ever been on the radar for you? Not really. Not really. Um, young family, right from the time I started training and... Um, yeah, look, I, I've just always been happy, happy training here yeah. in Sydney, and and particularly now in the last you know three to four years where the prize money's just gone through the roof. It's um, I don't think there's a better place to train. Yeah, so let's talk. You mentioned that before. You said it's never been a better time to be a trainer. The prize money is a big part of that, is it? That you can yeah, you feel like you're getting rewarded for your hard work. Yeah, that, definitely, definitely. Yeah. It is hard work, and any trainer will tell you that. And there's no there's no shortcuts in this game. If you're going to be successful, you've got to work really hard. And for me, that what that looks like because I'm not a big stable is, is, um, is constantly being, you know, at work and I don't mind it. So I've got plenty, plenty of really good staff, but I feel like for my own, um, the way I want to do things that I need to be there. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot of work in it, but would, yeah, we're getting rewarded now for sure financially. That's for mm -hmm. 
And so you mentioned before when you were working with John back in the early 2000s, he or late 1990s, sorry, um, you were getting a lot of tried horses. Yeah. And you're very well known for that. It's been a huge part mm. of your success. Um, I thought we might just talk about a couple tried horses you've had awesome success with. We might talk about Vision and Power back in the day, which one of the Doncaster. Yeah. And then we'll talk about uh, Maria Mia on Saturday. Fair to say that she's a sort of a tried horse as well. Yeah, yeah, well, she is, yes. Yeah, yeah no, she's come through that as well. So um, Vision and Power was, was pretty amazing. So Nick Moratis always owned Vision and, and Power. Nick Moratis, people don't know, owned Might and Power. Yeah. A lot of people, yeah. I mean, he's a very, very well-known person, but he owned Might and Power and mm. a lot of other, very, exceeding Excel. He had a yep. lot of good horses. Yeah, really good horses. Um, and Nick had him down there with Robert Smurden. Yep. Um, originally, and he was uh, he was also he started single figure odds in a Queensland Derby. So he was, but he'd only won one, I think, out of maybe nineteen starts. And they they chanced him at um, at hurdling by the end. He mm. and he got beaten because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Smurden was good at the hurdles, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, the last thing he did before he came to me was get flogged in a hurdle trial, which you know is doesn't when when Nick sort of sent him up to me, I sort of looked at him. <laughs> So just let's, let's can you remember when Nick called you or someone from Nick's office called you and said, "Oh, we've got." This Would have just been you? Nick. I always only dealt with Nick. Yeah. Um, and at the position I was in at that time, I was pretty much just taking on whatever Nick wanted me to. Yep. And um, I did look at his form, and I was encouraged because he had peak runs in there that suggested he had, and he was very well bred horse. Um, mm. He was by Carnegie, but he was a half to um, Glamapus. So he had a, he had a decent pedigree. And he was a nice type, and when he arrived, I wasn't disappointed. Yep. Um, but it took a couple of preps to really get him thinking the right way. And um, he had that one amazing preparation. Um, and I think it was partially when I moved out to Warwick Farm, he, he found that new environment very much to his liking. And he, I remember when he trialled, I can still see it now, when he trialled on the, on the Viscaride track, which was the poly track at the time, the synthetic track at the time. And I thought, wow, that's, um, you've come back at a, a different level this time. And, and he had yeah, 10 starts at prep and won six. Yeah. A couple of group ones. And he, he, was, he won the George Rider, right? Yep. He won the George yep. Rider, which is one of the hardest way for age yep. races to win. Mm. And then the Doncaster, which is obviously... He was the, just amazing, that preparation. And it was... Um, it was a culmination for him, and he had he was so good that prep. I think that probably saw him out. And yep. every good horse has, has, has got an, um, a finite amount of good runs in them. When you know. he came to you for Nick Moratis after running the hurdle, were you thinking? <laughs> I mean, probably a stupid question, but you weren't thinking that. What was your? What did you think you could get out of him? You're like, oh, I'll just try and city horse, just a, yeah, just so a nice no, city horse. You, yeah. you never crossed your mind. Yeah. He'd win well, a, a George Ryder and a Doncaster. Well, that that preparation he won. That good preparation. He won um, three races to start with, just open handicaps from memory, and then he won the Parramatta Cup. And I thought to myself, done a really good job with this horse. Yeah, that mission could be accomplished. The, that yeah. could be the culmination. It was a heavy yeah. tan. I sort of thought he had a few things in his favour. He carried a big weight. Yeah, and then he, um, yeah, and then he ran second um, to think Tuesday Joy maybe in the Chipping Norton, and that was one a weight phrase. I sort of thought maybe he's even better than I thought. And then he won, um, and then he ran um, fourth in the um, in the Ranvit over 2,000 metres, and uh, Nick rang me up the next day and he said, Jimmy, who'd been riding in Pumper, Pumper uh, yeah. said he's had enough. Yeah. And I just, as soon as the owner says to me that the jockey, you know, they start talking about what the jockey said, it's just like, no, nah, come on. <laughs> so, no, nah, I didn't think he'd had enough. And uh, I said, no, nah, I'll just freshen him up, Nick. I'm going to run him in the, in the rider. And uh, thankfully I didn't listen to the advice because he won two group ones straight yeah. away. Yeah. yeah. And look, Jimmy was right most of the time with those things, but I, 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 I just knew it wasn't the right race for him that day. And once he got into the right races, again, he – Finished the preparation off so well. Yeah. And is would that be your biggest win, that Doncaster? My biggest win? Yeah, personally. Um, one of my favourite wins. Yep. Yeah, I'm not sure. They're, they're hard to, uh, to to match up. A lot of the, the big wins, it's what time of your life and what's, what else is going on that, that, that they pop up. Sometimes if you're having a bit of a tough run and you win a big race, it just means so much more to you. Yeah. And there are other times you certainly never take it for granted, but you're just on a bit of a run and it's just part of another you know, successful cycle that you have. So, but that was a really special win. It was, it was yeah. amazing. Um, so let's talk about Maria Mia. Um, firstly, what a win on Saturday. So you're up against Golden Mile, the Caulfield Guineas winner, and you guys were second favourite, and she just kicked his brains in. It was good. It was good. It was a good call from Darren too. He's something about, and here comes the, you know, the, yeah. the boom colt, and she just took off. Yeah, and yeah. It was amazing to watch, and she broke the clock, and um, yeah, it was, it was a super win. So she's, um, she's, She's doing what horses do occasionally, and she's just um, she's just in the zone, and she's just uh, she can't get beaten at the moment. Well, she doesn't. Think she, she's had two trials and two runs, and she's won all of them. Were you confident going into Saturday? Um, I, I knew I'd hit those horses at the right time. Yep. Like Golden Mile, when I watched him parade, he'd had one trial and he looked pretty burly. And I sort of thought, well, if we're going to beat him, it's going to be today. So yep. I, I didn't go in there just thinking we we're going to win. I thought she'd run really well, and being a mare, running really well in a Group Two is a very valuable thing to them. But um, she surprised me. She went so so mm. well. Just the way that she, Golden Mile loomed up, and she went, nah, 
Yeah, and just went bang. She's tenacious at the moment. On. She's just in the right frame of mind, and uh, so it'll take a really good horse to beat her the way she's the way she's going. And New Haven Park own her. Yeah. Um, did they buy her off somebody else? Yeah, they bought her online in the um, in the digital sale. Brilliant. So paid good money for her. Yeah. Um, what did they pay for her? Oh, look, I think it's around three hundred, but yeah. um, you know she's worth a fair bit more than that now, and she's won plenty of prize money al- along the way. But they're very good judges. Um, the Kelly uh, boys and, and they know exactly what they're doing. They um, they target horses and it's good. They've they I'm their sort of go to trainer when it comes to trial horses. They won't give me a baby, but yeah, they they do give me so these can you mares. T- so can you tell us the conversation that happened with with the Kelly the New Haven Park? What happens? Yeah. They call you and they just say, "Look, we bought this one." Oh, I'm pretty sure. I've, I, I think I might have been driving somewhere. John typically in when I take a phone call and, and John rang me said, "Oh, we bought, uh, we bought Maria Me. Do you want to give her a go?" And I've just got full confidence that they're buying the right horses. So it's, it's an easy one. You know, yeah. someone offers me a baby, I want to go to the drive at the paddock and have a look at it. Someone offers me a tried horse like that. It's just a no-brainer. Happy to take them on. And when you were you think, what did you think her limit was? She'd already had um, nearly 30 starts and it's a pretty fair, fair assumption to make that when a horse has had more than 10 or 15 that you might have seen the best of them mm. unless there's an underlying reason why you haven't. So her profile is a bit unusual, but she had a peak run in there that was a, um, a second or a third to Probabil, beaten mm-hmm. close up, that looked really good. And I thought, well, she can do that. She's just basically going around every couple of weeks. So there wasn't... Um, I thought that maybe there was room for improvement in the way that she was being placed. And, um, yeah, she just had a, had a good prep here, the first prep, but had a really significant spell during the, um, during the sp- spring, and she's just come back a stronger horse. And she's going to Galaxy? Good chance. Yeah, I'm going to run her in the Millie Fox in uh, – it'll be three weeks between runs. It sort of looks a, a really nice race for her being at Rose Hill, and then maybe a freshen up a month later into the Galaxy, yeah. And are we going to lose her to the breeding barn? Will she not – I'd say so for sure. We Will won't she, see yeah, spring. That's no, no, no. Which, well, well, look, I mean, she's – is she five, I think? So um, – and, and she'll be at that point, I think, by the end of this preparation, she will have raced right up to her mark. Yep. So I've, it, it's not too disappointing when you get a chance to do that with a horse. You know, I'd, it's maybe different when a colt gets rushed off to stud after, you know, 10 starts. You would have loved to, we would love to see what they can do after that. But with a mare like that, she will have achieved everything she can on the racetrack. Have you prepared any colts that have gone on to stallion deals? Look, it's not the style of horse that I typically buy, can afford, or, but, um, no, sorry, no is the answer. Yep. But it's, it's sort of not something that, it's not really part of our agenda. Like you, there are some stables around that are specifically just chasing their next good look, Godolphin. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. their, that their whole operation is revolved around trying to find the next cult. So it's not, it, it certainly could happen to me, but it's the good cults are very rare. And even a, even an operation like Godolphin still buy cults from other people. Yes. That's how hard they are to get. And they're yeah. churning through hundreds of horses every year. Yeah. So it'll happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it hasn't, uh, hasn't happened yet. No, yeah. no high profile ones. I had a few, but, Probably yeah. don't bear mentioning. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what I, I like when I do this podcast, I like to try and take the viewer on a little bit of a journey that they might not know about. Um, I had <laughs> Brent Navdala in here and I thought I'd talk to him. He obviously rides for you and you've had good success with him. And I thought I'd be interested to ask him about what it's like when you're riding in a race and what the other jockeys are mm. going to say to him. What I thought would be interesting to do with you is talk about private eye. And if we go – and I want to sort of know – what his path has been since he had his last start at Flemington, where he was a bit disappointed, had a yep. really good spring, but was a bit disappointing. And then what's his pathway from basically after that day to now when he had a trial on Monday? Yep. Um, so just sort of what happens with him, because I think people will find it interesting to mm. know. Okay. Yeah. So five weeks in the paddock for him, came back into the stable early December. And so where does he, to... what paddock does he go to? Um, he spelled at, where did he spell this time? He was spelled at Fenford, I think, or did I spell him at Jazzcom? Can't quite remember. And so from, does got, he go from – so he finishes at Flemington, you're like, right, let's Yeah, that's right, out. brought him back home. Got so him. he comes to work back, – back to work yeah, Farm Fenford Stables. it was actually. Fenford Farm, which is down the Southern Highlands near yep. Exeter. Do a great job down there. And he had five weeks there. And what happens when they're in the paddock? Is he just – they just roll around? Just, <laughs> Pretty much. Just, it's a holiday. It's a holiday. Yeah. You know, they're, they're fed, uh, but it's a holiday. They're looked after. Um, but it's about them just being as far away from a racetrack as they can and that time to, to recover and yep. get over whatever kind of preparation they've had. Um, but and you notice when they come back that they, they're a bit more pep in their step and they're ready to get Yeah, definitely. Their work. Um, and just normally a bit of what, a fair bit of weight gain, but yep. not not muscle necessarily. They, yep. they very rarely look better when they come. Well, they, could look, they look maybe a little bit prettier, which just means they're a bit fatter, but they don't, um, they're not race fit. So they yep. don't, um, 
but uh, the, the spelling places now, there's plenty of good ones, do a fantastic job in, in getting the horses ready in short turnarounds because we don't have long between carnivals mm. um, in the short turnaround to, to make sure they look the best when they come back. Yep. So he has five wing in the paddock and then he comes back d- to your stable? Straight to the stable, yeah. Yep. No, no pre-training for him. Uh, yep. Just a horse I won under my... Um, uh, under my eye right from the start. So of the when operation. this is sort of mid-December, is it just before yeah. Christmas? Yeah, back to uh, you? even early December, yep. Yeah. Yep. And then what? what's the, like, so he, does he start training the second he gets back? In oh, yeah, yep. He straight doesn't in miss or... a beat. Yep, yep. yep. So that's back to his normal routine. Walk walk for first thing in the morning, um, gets his rider on him, has a swim, another walk um, in the afternoons, a swim and a walk, and it's just a... Um, as I, say, as I was saying earlier, it's quite repetitive, but the horses love the routine. They go at the same time every morning, have basically the same people around them all the time, um, and um, they, they enjoy it. I mean, he's he's just a natural athlete, that horse. Mm. He's, he's, he's really, really lazy. Yeah. Um, doesn't put any effort into his training whatsoever, and he's, he's a little bit quirky, but um, that's why you need the same people around them all the time, and, and you just get a um, you get a feel for how they've come back in that in that time. Um, so there's nothing that interesting going on at that point. Yeah. You know? So there's no gallops here, right? No fast work. Um, after he'd been in about uh, between th- week three and week four, he starts his fast work. Yeah. So the first two weeks is just walking, swimming. Yeah. Getting- Familiar yep. with the stable again. Yep, and just building up a, a you know, they, they come back with carrying good residual fitness from from you know from a spring campaign, but um, you need to get them uh, prepared to sort of to go a bit faster, and um, that's just yeah, a few weeks of pretty low key sort of exercise, doing enough with them so that they don't um, uh, not misbehave, but so that they're not too fresh, and just keeping a lid on them. And I, I think what a lot of people don't realise is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but horses don't do anywhere near the volume that a, a human athlete no. would do, right? No. Because that's, that's what right. I've had owned a few horses, and when I go and I watch them in track work, I'm surprised how little they do. Like yep. they sprint up over 1,200, 1,400. You, and that's you'd be it. really horrified how little mine do. So yeah, right. Isn't that interesting? Um, but then you got to like say someone is a human is training for a marathon. Yep. They're doing 20, 25 kilometers a day yep. every day. You know, and mm. then maybe another like you know. So yeah, that's well, I, I I um I my my gallops are all quite short. Um, even with a horse like Stockman, so um, short and sharp, but that builds builds it will leave speed in their legs, which I yep. think is so important. And I think it's um, um, part of the strength, or one of the real strengths of my training is to be able to make horses fast. And it sounds like such a simple concept, but um, overtraining takes speed away from them, and you don't want to do that. Yeah. Okay. So where he's had his few weeks of just getting back into things, then you start some faster work. Yep. And so let's just say that's around New Year, probably yep. right. And what are we? So the whole month of January. So, and what would be his first piece of fast work? How just far a bit of three quarter pace. So he'd go six hundred meters at about fifteen or well, fifteen seconds for each two hundred meter segment. Yeah. So, and just do that once. A uh, couple of times a week. So just twice a week. That's all he does. I only gallop my horses twice a week. Yeah. Isn't that? I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I find that extraordinary. Like, yeah. Yep. I think a lot of people would as well. That it's yep. just you know that you don't yep. they don't do that much, and yet they just. Once horses have got a, a, a base level of fitness, they really don't need too much more. Yeah. And I think, uh, as I think overtraining of horses is, is, is quite common. Um, even with stayers, I, I think there's a, every, every bit of, and I, I swim my horses twice a day, but every bit of work you do to a horse gets it fitter, but you're also running the risk of, um, of injuries. Or, you know, yeah. and when I say injuries, it might just be just little niggles or, you know, every, every gallop's a, a, another test for that horse to get through. So um, you've got to, the, 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 uh, the art of training for me and the way I do it is getting a horse to, um, to be fit enough to win a race and causing the least amount of harm to that horse. Yes. That's a simple yeah. sort of yeah. way to put it. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then, okay, so say we sort of in mid-January and then do you start, when did he have his first proper gallop? He doesn't have any proper gallops because he won't go. <laughs> right. <laughs> As I said, he's really, really lazy and casual. So, but he'll um, go on race day. He'll go on race day. It's, he very much, and I've had a lot of, lot of good horses like that. My first good horse was very much like that, Red Oog. So yeah. um, he, he basically just, he knows when it's competition. And I could, get me wrong, I could put him with a mate and I could make him work harder but I don't think that's good for his mind. Mm. I, I think he knows he knows when it's game time, and I'm happy for him to turn up on race day. And okay, so we moved through to we had a trial on Monday. It was yep. up against Nature Strip. So first question, I want to interested in what you think of Nature Strip. But first question about Private Eye: Was he wound up, or was he nowhere near? Um, if you can quantify it, and he's maybe he's sitting at about eighty percent at the moment. Yeah. And you were happy with his trial? He just very happy, just out yeah, there, yeah. just doing his thing. Yeah. I could have. Did the gun ride him? Was he? Yes. Yeah. I could yeah. have turned the trial off after I watched him jump. 
Yep. Like I'm that convinced yep. that he's going well. I see him jump out of the gates, and to me, it's always a really good indication when a horse pings out of the barriers. I don't know how you feel about that as a punter. When a horse, they don't have to ping out and keep running, but if they ping out of the gates, oh, well, they're, they're going on. well. I love that. Yeah. They're going well. Yeah. yeah. You know, and and, yeah. and for him, he he's really quick out of the gates. That horse. Yeah. It's actually got him into trouble a few times because he's a you know he's pr- primarily an off pace horse, and he just pings out, especially from wide barriers, and then you find yourself. And it was a problem for him in the autumn. We found ourselves having to drag him back through the field. Yeah. And you never, you know, you're giving away those head starts at the start of races. That's the hardest, hardest time or the easiest time to make ground. At the end, it's the hardest to make it up. Yeah. You know, and and um, he's he's actually a horse who's just so much better. And he got one in the in the um, in the Everest of, of drawing an inside barrier. Mm, mm. Important for him. Um, and what did you think of Nature's Trip in that? Oh, he's a good trial horse. Yeah. You're probably talking to the wrong bloke if you want someone to wrap up nature's trip. Nah, but I just, you know. Yeah, he just. Uh, no, he tried well, didn't he? He tried well. Yeah, he looked, he looked impressive. Yeah. He's a bit more like my other old warrior, um, Eduardo. You know, we figure yeah. they're in the twilight of the career, but people have been saying that about both of them for the last couple of years, and, and yet they don't get beat very often. Mm. So, um, mm. but uh, no, he, look, he's he's a champion nature's trip. He's, he's yeah. a very good horse. And uh, I'd say he, Chris is a, a master trainer, and I'm sure he'll have him at his at his peak or whatever he's capable of doing this preparation. So we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll uh, cross paths at some point. No doubt. What's Private Eye's grand final? Doesn't really have a grand final as such, but he's going to kick off in the new market and they left three trials before then and then go to the TJ. And that's basically his whole preparation centres around two runs. Anything after that isn't as important as those two runs because they're the big prize money races. And does the, is the gun locked in? Does he, is that how it works with that kind of thing? Or Did he ask you that? Or? No, 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 no. No, <laughs> no I'm just wondering. I, well, it's, it's, a, it's funny. Did you see the, the, the picture of the back of my float yesterday? Love, everyone loves it. The, yeah. you got private eye and... So John Walter asked me, he said, why didn't you put the gun's face in there? And I said, well, I can't sack him then, can I? So, yeah, that's uh, true. Uh, but he, he put it on, didn't he? John Walter. <laughs> Put the, did you see that? Yes, he, I did. He, he yeah, put, yeah, 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 yeah. So, oh, look, look, he's he's Brenton's ride at the moment. He was he was Regan's ride for a while, and because Brenton hurt himself, and um, you, I'm locked into jockeys for as long as they're riding well, and they're yeah, not suspended. I, the because, question was more: Do you do you say to a jockey, any jockey, that is there a, is there an agreement between you and a jockey at the start of a preparation? You're on this horse the whole way through, or just it's hard to get that. You need like a really that. good horse to get that. Yeah, and, and, and with a horse yeah, like yeah, Private Eye, I, I could get that commitment from Brenton. But at the same time, Brenton's free to jump off yep. if he if he thinks he comes up with a better offer. And I'd just rather this way with jockeys. If they think they can get a better ride, I'd rather them. T- I don't want them riding my horse if they don't think it's their best chance. Yeah, yeah. it's it's a negative frame of mind to go into a race with. So, yeah. and I, I, I want to be able to, they don't ride any track work for me. So I want to be able to change jockeys where I see fit. And then you get other combinations like Nash Willer and Eduardo, where it seems vital that he's on the horse. Yeah. It just doesn't seem like there's anyone else. Well, no one else has one on him up here in Sydney. Yeah. And whenever I've had to change jockey, it's, it hasn't worked. Yeah. So um, every horse is different. And does Eduardo have a grand final or you don't? Um, I'm just looking for some wet tracks for him. So yeah. he'll be ready to go soon. And um, his grand, grand final will most likely be, just be when he gets that opportunity. So I'm not specifically setting setting him for one race because, you know, say I made that race to TJ. If we get a bone hard track that day, then that's not the race he's going to yeah. win. Yeah. Cool. Um, move to some questions. And one of those questions, there was a question about um, horses in the wet. Um, yeah. Someone. So Nick Finns up on Twitter said, "Why have you had so much success with wet trackers?" few different things about this, I think. So, and I don't want to complicate it or bore you with all the details, but one of them is the pedigree of the horses that I train. I, I think a lot of those really well-bred horses, I'm not sure if they've been pampered too much, but I don't think they're tough enough to, to really to really dig in deep. I think my horses are, um, and I don't want to sound like I think I'm better than everyone else, but I think my horses have got a real desire to win. We, we, we um, And everyone trains their horses to win, obviously, but I think desire in tough conditions comes through mm-hmm. and i think that they've they've got that real will to win um and then um yeah look i, mean, I think they may and i don't think my horses are fitter than anybody else's you mm. know so you, some people might think well fitness would be something that would make you run a wet track i don't think so i think it's a combination of of pedigree desire um they'd be the two main things and it's the psychology of the horse do you look into that quite a bit i mean yes you did, yeah so you're yeah. Mm. Yeah, a big part of is how the horse is going mentally. The right? simple, the simple theory is a happy horse is, is yeah. a successful horse, and so you've, we've, we go to great length to make sure that that horse is is well being is taken care of, obviously, but is also enjoying their exercise and enjoying the race day experience, yeah. which is once again simplifying it a fair bit, but and it's an individual thing, but that's so important. 
So this next question is about whether your son's going to join you in your training. And I'll just preface this by saying when we had Richard Friedman in on the podcast, he said he did everything he possibly could to stop Will being to a discourage trainer. discourage him. Mm. And then finally said, all right, fine, let's do it. Mm. Um, is your son showing interest in becoming a trainer? He, he definitely is. So um, Brave turned 17 uh, last week and mm-hmm. he's got one more year of high school left. And um, it's important that um, if he does join the business, and I, th- I think he will, I think mm. – um, and your uh, wife's in the business too, is that right? Yes, yes, yeah. she's part of the team. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that he um, is that he brings something else to the to the business, you know? And and uh, he's a very different personality to, personality to me, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, um, he's got uh, he's a lot more open to. Um, uh, it's just he's just got a, a a more engaging personality with 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 other people, which I think is really going to help him. You know, I think he's um, yeah. he's very well received by everybody that sort of has anything to do with him, and. Um, I think it's a real strength, and if he can, uh, say, bring something different into the business, and, and we're not sure what that looks like yet. You now, how we're we going to, yeah. Kylie, it's my wife, and I, and I, we talk about it, you know, often about how we can, um, how we can broaden his um, his education and make sure that uh, if he does join the business, that he that he um, that he comes in with a with a with a healthy perspective on it all. And I don't want to see him do what I've done, and it basically just take over my whole my whole life mm-hmm. where I. I basically sort of become yeah, obsessive. Yes, yeah. I, I want him to, and he may have the opportunity, to, opportunity to do that because we we can share the workload. Yeah, and is he down? Do you, how often is he down the stables? Is he whenever he can get there? Early yeah. morning track work. Yes, like, will he yeah, get there at four a.m.? Yep, yep. So, so yeah, not every day now because he's back at school. Yeah. But during the holidays, he worked most days, and well, I'm, we're careful not to try and overdo it with him because I don't want to. We don't want to burn him out. But he's at the moment. It's more I'm holding him back. Yeah. Asks a lot of really intelligent questions, which I think is a great sign. Fantastic. Um, that's what you want to see. Anyone who's learning needs to ask questions, and um, he does. He does all those things. And yeah, look, some really promising signs there, but there's a long way to go. Yeah. Um, so Mitch on Twitter says, "What has been the biggest test to date as a trainer, and what do you like to do outside of racing to cope with the pressure?" Yep. Um, the biggest test. Charlatan's testing me at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's the horses that don't. Um, is someone says something about taking it to Bajerabong? <laughs> I don't even know where that is. I won't be going. He's going to, he's going to Goulburn I've, I've on Sunday. I've been to Bajerabong picnics. Okay, he's going to Goulburn on Sunday. That's probably okay. far enough. Um, the biggest test is is um, is just uh, is just dealing with those horses that that um, that don't really want to be don't really want to be race horses. Yeah. It's, it's the ultimate battle because no matter what you do, they basically find a, a different way to get beat, and it's frustrating. Because yeah. you know, I'm I'm employed to to get the best out of horses. The the good horses are so easy to train. Yes, um, they don't test you out at all. They're a pleasure to have around. Like I I just private eye and Eduardo just bring a smile to my face every time I look at them. So the, do you, are you some horses just don't want to be race horses? Is that yeah? It's it's and basically well they just don't they don't give they don't give everything they've got on race day and that makes it hard. And you tip them out pretty quickly and just I, I try and identify happen. that because it's no yeah. good for for anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But they can easily yeah. go to a, a weaker jurisdiction and make it. But here in Sydney. Very progressive racing, a lot of young horses on the up. So once they sort of get to that point where, and they can lose interest, you know. Um, mm. And once they get to that point where they're they're not competing at the level, this just it's pointless in being here. So. Mm. And what do you, the second part was? What do you do to, to sort of get away from the pressure? Not very good at that bit, as I sort of right. highlighted before. Yeah, I, should, I, I need to improve at that. I'm not sure it might, it might be too late for me to improve. I'm I'm uh, I'm 50 now, but um, not enough downtime. Um, yeah. Love my sport. Love watching, particularly football and cricket. When I say football, I mean rugby league and cricket. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, it's um, I don't spend enough time relaxing. So yeah, uh, yeah, weakness for sure. And South Sydney Rabbitoh fan, do you, will you yep. watch every single Bunnies oh, yes, game? Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah fantastic. Yeah. No, I love it. We'll be. I'm a Bunnies fan too. Yeah. We'll be there in abouts this year again. Yeah, definitely. So. Yeah, no, good team. Looking forward to. Um, getting out to a few games, mainly just watch them at home with um, um, mainly my son actually. But uh, who he support? They see us. I yeah. couldn't let him go any other way. That's <laughs> part of your role as a father, isn't it? To, Absolutely. To make Absolutely. sure that they don't desert and yeah. go somewhere else. Yeah. So. No, I'm, I'm going. My kids are young, so I'm teaching yeah. them about it now. It's so. good. You can let them go for a little while. Brave started off as a Dragons fan for a couple of years, and I had a lot of trouble convincing him that a bunny would beat a dragon at anything. <laughs> but then when he un- when he understood what it all meant, a couple of years later, I got him on side. Yeah, well, it's been a yeah. good. He, he went the right way because yeah. it's been pretty tough yeah. to be yeah. Terry, you know, Terry Bailey, the race yes. caller. He's yeah. one of the last Dragon yeah. supporters well, left. Well, he, he went for the Dragons for two years and they won a premiership. So yeah. He's got a bit of luck on his side, yeah. this kid. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. yeah. oh, right, that's that's cool. <laughs> um, what else we got? Uh, so Marto Running says, best tip for someone looking to get involved in ownership? Can definitely help him out with that. Yeah, look, it's, it's, not, it's not – I mean, there's so many – 
um, we're, we're sport for choice now with, with that stuff. And um, yep. this, you've only got to go onto any trainer or, or, um, or syndicator's website and, you, and you'll see that you can get involved. Um, I think it's important to race horses with people um, the same with, with, with like-minded sort of interests. I think that's important. But, um, you know, we can – anyone who approaches the stable, we can, we can guide them into what we think is a nice fit for them. And, um, yeah, look, it's such a – the, the, the level of appreciation you get for training a winner for someone and for anyone who hasn't owned a horse, I can't speak highly enough of the enjoyment that people get out of winning a race. Yeah, it's a real I, rush. I, honestly, yeah. it, it, you could save someone's kid from a runaway train and they wouldn't be as appreciative as they are when you win them a group race. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you think there's people doing brain surgery and, and saving lives and they're probably lucky, they get paid, but they're probably lucky to get a thank you when you train someone a winner. There's yeah. just a level of appreciation through the yeah. roof. But it's great. It's a real, it gives me a buzz. So. Yeah. Mm. This is an interesting question. In Joe's opinion, if he trained private eye solely to be a sprinter, does, does he think he would be the best in the country? Big question. He's probably he nearly is the best in the country, isn't he? Yeah. Sprinter, sprinter at the moment. Private eye? Yeah. 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 He got past nature's trip pretty, yeah. pretty well in that, in that Everest. Um, yeah. Uh, well, he's going to sprint for the next um, few preparations anyway, so we'll, we'll find that out. Um, it's a bit, for, for mine anyway, it's a bit over overdone to train them as a sprinter, train them as a uh, – private eye, basically, he's just got faster as, as he's got older. He was an Epsom winner, Queensland Guineas winner, and when he was doing that, he was getting back in the field and, and running home. And just over the last couple of years, we've really – He's built his speed up. He's got a lot stronger, and he's he's dictated where we've got to. Really, I didn't have consciously in my mind, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this horse into a sprinter. Yeah. You know, he just I. You he listen to your you. horse, you yeah. watch them, you observe them, and you put them in the right races. And you know, he's found his way to that mark. Now, it's it's pretty rare that you see a an Epsom uh, winner and a Queensland Guineas winner just turn primarily into a sprinter. Yeah. But you do see it from time to time. Mahogany yeah. years ago yeah. won a couple yeah. of derbies and turned into a sprinter. So yeah. we say we say turned into. It's Horses evolve over time and I, I'm a big believer that they don't physically mature until they're uh, – well, this is not, I'm just a believer. It's a fact. They don't – uh, fully mature until they're five, six or seven years old, not many horses get the opportunity to race at that age yep. because they've either gone through the grades or, or burnt out or, you know, um, injuries or different things can stop them. But if you can look after them through that through that crucial early period and see them, like, I'm so excited about Private Eye, what he's going to be able to do as an older horse. What about Royal Ascot? Um, for a gelding, it's more about the experience of, for the owners, isn't it? Mm. Like there's not a lot of – it's not a big – with what we can race for here now in Australia. Saying they're, they're saying they're, there's nothing like an owner thanking you for winning yeah. the race. What about if they thank you for winning I, Royal Ascot? I wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't take him there. In my mind, I'm thinking I wouldn't take him there until I thought he'd achieved – well, he needs to achieve more here in Australia. It's not to prove that he's good enough. It, I would hate to think that I took him there and he didn't come back from there. Yep. But you you're – Risk you it all you've, for – You've for, never for had for a horse at Ascot, have you? No, no. I've taken one to Hong Kong but not, not to Ascot. Who did you take to Hong Kong? Red Oog. Yeah, of course. Yep. And that was at the end of his career, probably too late. But would you like to go to Ascot? Would you love to have it, or are you just indifferent? Yeah. To it? Oh, look. No, no, I would. I would. I'm. Um, I'm not a great traveller. <laughs> yeah. Part of the problem. I'm not sure how. I've I've never flown any further than Hong Kong, so I'm not sure yeah, right. how I'd get yeah. twenty hours on a plane in. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I can sit still for that long. Yeah. Might need to be sedated, heavily yeah. sedated. I think. Yeah. So, but look, the, that aside, if the horse had to go to England to race and there was a right opportunity for him, especially breeding stock, I would have no hesitation taking it's one. Usually, it's the owners who push that kind of thing, is I think if, so. If the owners, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I'd be more than happy to accommodate them with it. It just hasn't yeah. really bobbed up yeah. yet that the right horse um, has you know, required that to further their career. Yeah. This is a quick little question from Zane Prince: Would Joe rather win a Group One or see the bunnies lift the trophy? In 2014, I got to see both. I got one, I think, three Group Ones, and and they lifted the trophy. So oh, good. different discipline. Did you go to that grand different final? Different things. No, no, I watched it at home. Different, yeah. different, um, different parts of my life. Um, both big buzz. Yeah, like I, I, they're not things I compare. It's they're, they're yeah, they're just different parts of my life. Yeah, cool, mate. I think we're we're pretty much we're done. So awesome chat. Yep. Um, I think everyone will really enjoy it. Get a lot of insight. You're um. You're super approachable, obviously, and if anyone, <laughs> yes, it, yeah, I mean, if anyone wants to get into ownership and stuff, yeah. um, they should just contact it's, you. Or contact it's so much easier now. So we've got um, all trainers are really well set up with uh, with websites. I've got a racing manager, all uh, and uh, that everyone in the team does a fantastic job to to welcome new people in, and um, also you know my syndicators. 
say uh, Jamie Walter, proven thoroughbreds, fantastic. You wouldn't meet a uh, a, a nicer bloke, and um, he's, he runs a fantastic business which takes care of a lot of p particularly first time owners. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. All right, well, mate, uh, it's going to be a huge order, and uh, thank you very much for coming in. Great, let's go get some lunch. Perfect. Cheers. Thank you.